Hello, I'm Laura McGreevy McInerney. Um, my husband was Michael McGreevy. He was the OIC in charge of Echo Platoon at the time of Operation Red Wings. Well, 15 years later, uh, you know, it feels like yesterday some days and it feels like 100 years ago some days, but I want the world to remember he was just an amazing human being and no matter no matter how bad things got, he always had a smile on his face. No matter how hard things were, he always, he never gave up. Uh, he's always making me smile. And the most important thing to him was his family. He loved being a SEAL and it was, I'm sure it was something that he was born to do. But the number one thing in his life was me and me and Molly, his daughter. And um, every day, Every day he could call me, he could, and just ask about what she was doing. She was a baby. When it happened, she was 15 months old, and now she's 16 years old. I cannot believe it. Um, but I just want the world to know what, just what, a, what an amazingly positive and humble and amazing guy. Right, uh, my name is Shar Fontan Westfall. Um, wife of the late Jacques Fontaine, um, killed in Operation Red Wing back on June 28, 2005. Um, Jacques was a SEAL with SEAL Team 10 at the time and was um, his sixth year as a SEAL out of his uh, 16 years in the Navy. So um, we were rounding it out, getting to be uh, to the end of the line. Well, so we thought, you never know nowadays, but um, thought that was his last deployment and he was gonna be coming home but to all of us that knew him, he was more than a SEAL, he was more than a Navy guy. He was, you know, not only a husband, but a father to um, a beautiful daughter. He was a son, a good friend, and a brother, and um, an avid golfer, loved golfing. I think he, if he wasn't gonna get his dream to be a SEAL, he'd wanna go out on tour and golf. I mean, he like constantly had a, golf club in his hand. He broke a couple lights in our, our house at times, always swinging the club um, around and watching golf. And uh, he loved his city of New Orleans. That's where he was from. He loved good food and appreciated good food and expensive wine. And uh, despite his taste for expensive wine and food, he still just drank Coors Light, which uh, his dad and I still laugh about to this day. <laughs> Have such expensive taste and other things. But um, hey, I like it too, not bashing Coors Light. but just a family joke with that um, and he loved his New Orleans Saints and his LSU Tigers huge huge fan of both of those teams and uh, but he uh, another thing that was just so funny and amazing about him besides his personality and how he was always making me laugh and uh, I just always enjoyed having him around but his mind for sports was like anything I've ever seen the amount of statistics he kept in his head of sports and not just his sports teams but all sports teams and all sports across the board was uh, I often like joked with him about how much he could retain up there and just all the useless knowledge in my opinion that he had um, just loved being around his friends his family um, I know he loved me loved his daughter we loved him we miss him and um, I know that he loved being a seal and he loved this country and he would do it all again in a heartbeat. Um, but, you know, like I said, besides just being a hero, and he is, he is our hero, but he is also just an amazing man and somebody who was and still is loved and missed every day. My name is Aaron Taylor. I was married to Jeffrey Scott Taylor. Uh, he was a corpsman with SEAL Team 10 during Operation Red Wings. Uh, Jeff and I had married about 14 days before he deployed, and at the time of his death, we had been married for about 90 days. Um, Jeff was one of the funniest people I had ever met. Uh, he was an adrenaline junkie. He loved base jumping and skydiving. And I remember one of the first times we had gone base jumping, I heard somebody, you know, one, two, three, base and jumping off the side. And I thought, oh, that's his friend because he landed in a tree. And I'm like, I'm going to go sit in the car because I don't want to be a part of this. And then I came out and I realized it was him that was stuck in the tree. And he had like branches through his arms and, but he loved it. He was like, that was awesome. I'm going to do it again. Um, 
but he was really humble. He loved what he did. Um, before he deployed, he had considered getting out and it was a really tough decision whether he wanted to stay in or get out. And uh, I told him that I supported whatever he wanted to do. Um, but when it came down to it, one of the things that he said to me was that you can't build a picnic table with three legs. And he said, I've trained with these guys. I've deployed with these guys and I'm gonna finish this out. And he was the happiest he'd ever been over there. Like every time we would talk on the phone, he'd be like, it's awesome, I love it. And I'm like, how can you love this? Like, but he did, he loved it. And all the guys when they came home said like, oh, he was so happy. And uh, he tried to stay the entire six months because Corman's were allowed to do six month rotation, but he had not taken some sort of class. And so they made him, they were gonna make him leave after three months, but he uh, re-enlisted over there and he was, Deciding he was going to do the Seaman to Admiral program and just absolutely loved what he did. And uh, he lived wholeheartedly and without regret, and I am envious of his ability to do that. Hi, my name is Patsy Dietz. My husband was Danny Dietz. He was stationed with um, SDV Team 2, he was the comms guy for Team 10. Um, and he died in Operation Red Wing on June 28, 2005. Um, one of the things that obviously sticks out to me and was depicted clearly in the book and also the movie, um, he had a heart of a lion. He was tough as a male and he loved his country and he fought until his last breath. And that brought me comfort because I know that he did it for this beautiful country and for us, for me, um, to make sure that the enemy would not come to our soil. On the same token, he was very humble. He was very generous. He was very just. Um, he was a brilliant, very smart man. He self-taught himself everything. Um, he self-taught to draw and would draw and paint at the commands, their logos, and uh, he would be requested at other teams to come out and uh, do their logos as well. Um, and that all was, was just him reading books and books. Uh, that's one of the things we used to do on the weekends. We would get coffee and, and just go to Barnes and Nobles and spend hours just, I would watch him read books and um, he would just learn incredible things that he would come home and do, you know, build things and he had a workshop in the garage and he also was very kind hearted and 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 caring for for humans. He would come from a twelve hour day at work and exhausted of training and just being and working and all that stuff and he would come around six PM and he would take off his uniform and go next door to the neighbor and help him build a fence. And that's just the way he was, you know, he never complained or anything, you know, he, he knew that somebody needed help and he would go and help them out. Uh, one of the things that would amaze me about him is that how he was able to switch from being a seal and being this badass guy to coming home and just being my husband and, and just being your regular neighbor next door. You would never know that he was a seal. He, I mean, that was just something that he carried in his heart and we knew that he was, but you would never know by if, if you didn't know that he was a seal. Um, he loved his dog. Um, at the time, I just got out of the Navy in uh, February. He deployed in April. And one of the plans that we had was to start a family when he got back from deployment. And um, that was the main reason why I got out of the military. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I, he loved me two amazing dogs. And um, those were our babies. And um, I miss them every day. You know, I'm very happy with my life because I got a second chance to rebuild it. And I live full heartedly for him. And I'm able to accomplish everything that he's not able to accomplish. And um, I'm just grateful that I was able to spend time that I did with him and um, just watch him grow into this incredible person um, and watch him do what he loved. And for that, I. I'm honored that I had that chance. 
So I would like to say thank you to everybody that even after 15 years, they still love this story. They still love these men. They still remember them. They still talk about them. You guys have not allowed our husbands to die. You have carried them in your hearts. You have shared the story. And for that, I'm very, very thankful. Um, many people don't have that. You know, once you pass away, your loved ones carry you, but um, America has not let them go and they forgot it. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm the surviving spouse of Matt Axelson. Um, I wanted to just share something that's uh, something with everyone that I don't think many people know. Um, something that's kind of funny about Matt. Um, one of his favorite shows was Friends. And um, he'd kill me probably knowing that I'm sharing this, but we had all of the DVD box sets for every season. And it wasn't because I wanted to buy it, it was because every time a new season came out, he wanted to buy it. Um, but I, I think the reason why he really loved Friends was because of the groups of friends that he grew up with and how important his friends were to him. Um, and those relationships that he built um, throughout his life. So growing up, he um, was involved with his church's youth group. So him and his older brother um, were only a couple years apart. So their youth group um, friends was, was quite big and robust. And I had um, the pleasure of meeting a lot of them throughout the years and just such a, a, a good group of, of girls and guys. And, um, and then when he went away to college, when I met him, um, I also met him through some of his friends. And, you know, they, I could just see the love and the care that each one of them had for each other, the unconditional love that Matt had for each and every one of them. Um, it was one of the reasons why I fell in love with him. And then um, I think as he was transitioning from college and thinking about what he was gonna do next, uh, he was a poli sci major, he was a huge history buff. And, um, and I know that he felt that he needed to um, that he wanted to serve his country. Um, and that one of his friends from uh, his youth group growing up um, was actually a SEAL. So he grew up hearing stories about, you know, his adventures and, um, and the camaraderie that he had with his other teammates. And I think that really, um, you know, it was something that, that Matt thought about and thought, you know, I think this, this could be a great opportunity for me to kind of continue um, that, you know, find that group of friends and and, um, and also serve my country. So, you know, that's when he decided to go into the teams and um, and there he met, you know, a great group of guys as well, you know, loving all of his brothers. And um, I just, you know, wanted to share that. Um, I, I know that all of his friends all throughout his life meant so much to him. Um, and I know how much they meant, um, how much Matt meant to them. Um, so I, it's just something that I, I, I loved. I loved how much he loved everyone that was in his life. Hi, I'm Rhonda, and um, I want to thank you for this time of remembrance of our men and that we get to share a little insight on some things that are, are more personal, not the men in the uniform. Uh, many publications and things have been written about the, the, the valor and the bravery and the honor uh, and the heroism, but um, things that I remember and the stories told, you know, behind the scenes, if you knew my husband Jeff, were that he was um, a big child, uh, funny, uh, prankster, not very serious, and the stories go on and on and on. And um, it was always the person to count on to smile when the situation was rough. And he did that on the field and in the house. I definitely miss that person in my life who, when times are down, would bring a joke and lighten the, the atmosphere and the mood. And uh, Jeff always had a joke and always saw the brighter side and always saw the lighter side of life. And, and that's what I, I hope that uh, we can remember during this time. I'm Norminda Healy and I'm the wife of Daniel Healy. Um, Again, I like to thank everyone for giving me this chance to kind of tell you about um, the other half of Dan's life. Other than um, him being a private professional, he um, he was also a great husband, a wonderful father. <laughs>
Yes, he was a silent warrior, but um, a lot of people knew that Dan was not quiet. He was uh, loved to be the life of the party, um, was always there for everyone. He had a really funny side of him. Uh, he loved playing golf. I think a, a big part of uh, his life was not just the seal, but um, the people that were there, they were his brothers. They're, they were his family, um, just like us. And he would do anything for them as he did. And just like he was with the, the family. Dan was honest. He was sometimes brutally honest at times, um, but for the good, you know, to help people out. And um, one night I was cooking and my daughter uh, Nia and Dan had this conversation where she was telling him, you know what, I want to be like you, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And he goes, oh, I thought you were just going to just want to be awesome. <laughs> and she said, well, that too. But, um, you know, I kind of cringed because I thought, oh no, what is he going to say to her? Is he going to say, you know, no girls allowed? But um, he just told her, you know, it's hard work. You have to be dedicated. You have to have to be mentally and emotionally and intellectually, you know, ready for this and you can't quit. Um, and she says, I could do all of that. I wanna save the world just like you. And he turns around and just tells her, you know what? I believe you can. And it just meant a lot to her and it meant a lot to me too, because it's just something that he always did. He always encouraged people and, um, you know, I just miss that about him and I miss him. I truly miss him, that beautiful soul. Uh, my name is Chase Patton. Uh, I am one of three of Shane's brothers. The way that I would uh, describe Shane's personality was that he was pretty electric. I mean, whether you knew Shane your whole life or you'd only met him for five minutes or in passing or whatever it was, something about him you just always remembered. And he, he was always very playful. He joked around a lot. He cracked a lot of jokes. He would try to play pranks on you all the time. Um, anything he could do to kind of, you know, to make you laugh. He was all about keeping a smile on everybody's face. And, um, you know, growing up in, in, uh, in school and everything, I mean, we, we skateboarded everywhere we went. We didn't even ride, we wouldn't, we refused to ride bicycles. We just skateboarded everywhere. Uh, <laughs> He was into baseball. I mean, he played on the baseball team for Boulder City High School. Uh, he was a pitcher. Um, he even was in a band when he was in high school. Uh, he was in a, a punk rock band, so he played guitar and things like that. Um, he he did so many different things that um, he just, everybody just loved him. Everyone, I mean, all the people even in Boulder City that grew up with him uh, speak so highly of him. And I've never once heard like one negative story. He really does seem like he was one of those people that everybody just truly loved. And they just couldn't get enough of his, his personality, like his laughter and, and the sound of his laugh and the way he carried himself. And he always seemed like a natural leader or a, one of those people that you kind of just always looked up to no matter what. And, um, I, and you know what was crazy too? Another thing about him that he was just good at everything. It didn't matter what it was. You thought you were great at basketball or or you thought that you had a, a bigger bench press than him or whatever, he could, he just could somehow be, it, it didn't even make sense. And even like as a, when I was a little kid, you know, like me and my younger brother Dean would play video games or whatever it was. And we thought we were the greatest. And we knew that Shane had never even touched it. You know, he hadn't even played. He, you know, goes to work and does whatever before he would come home from school. And uh, he would come home and he would just slobber us. Like it wasn't even, <laughs> you know, like, and I've heard that story. Uh, numerous times with other people who were like, man, and Shane just came out of nowhere in, you know, this bas this pickup basketball game we were playing and knowing Shane never really played basketball ever. And he could, he could shoot hoops, no problem. But like, I don't know what it was. It was almost like somehow he was just Mr. Perfect and you couldn't ever understand why. Or it was like, how did you get these jeans? And I didn't get those jeans. Like what's going on, you know? Like, it just didn't make sense. And um, man, but but we loved him for it, you know? He was just, uh, he was, uh, <laughs> he was a real American, for sure. 
He absolutely loves everything about this country. He loved his freedom. He loved his family. He loved his brothers. He loved his guys and teams. <clears throat> and he loved everything about being in the military. He absolutely loved it more than anything in the world. <sighs> I miss that guy more than I can even describe, you know? My name is Judy Gore. I'm the mother of Seamus Gore that was killed in 2005. When he was uh, 17, he was trying to decide what he was going to do in his life. And so he he uh, went to the Army recruiter and talked to them. Well, he com comes home one night and he says, um, Mom, I need you to sign this paper because um, I have to go to Columbus, Ohio, and, and um, talk to the recruiter. I said, OK. So that's what he told me. I just had to sign this paper, but he didn't tell me what the paper was about. So he comes home that night and he says, Mom, I'm in. And I said, you're in what? And he says, I'm in the army now. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. And I started crying. My husband calls, he was on the road, he calls and he said, what is wrong with you? And I said, you talk to your son right now. I said, he joined the army and he, I signed him in. He said, no. And I said, yes, he did. My second son, Courtney, got married in Hawaii in 2004 and uh, Seamus was able to get leave because he never took leave. He had so much leave left and uh, meet us in Hawaii and uh, watch his brother get married and stand up for him. So that was pretty awesome. We're so happy about that. And that was 2004. And then Courtney was killed a year later. So he's killed a year after Seamus. So it's been a pretty tough time, but we try to get through it every day. His birthday was May 28th, and this was right before he was killed. I told, gave everybody his address overseas, and um, he he called he called me actually, texted me, and said, "Mom, I got so many birthday cards." He said, "I don't know how that happened." I said, "I don't either." I said, "People like you," and he said, "Well, the guys were really jealous because I got all these cards." <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Oh, he was putting together a '67 Buick special and it was all packed in his garage when they went to move it he had just bought a house in drink in georgia so the guys went there and they had to he had baggies and everything else to put the car together but he never told him what color he was gonna, he never told us what color he was going to do it so the when we went down to visit in uh, savannah georgia with the other team members uh, they said, told us what color they uh, he wanted that done, and it was a gray, the gray um, Mustang on um, going in 60 seconds. So we got the car painted and got the car put back together. Courtney got to only work on it one day to, before he was killed, and Charlie and I had to finish it. So that was pretty tough, but that gave us something to do. I'm Maureen Murphy, and I'm going to speak about my son, uh, Michael Murphy. And, um, you know, I just want to let you know that he was born on Mother's Day weekend in the bicentennial year of 1976. And um, they wanted a picture of us for, or it was my first Mother's Day. So he made the paper like two days when after he was born. And, um, when he was five years old, he was like, um, he was really a, like a, a smart little kid. He was very adventurous. And one day I went outside and, and opened the garage door and there was all this wood in my garage. I mean, brand new wood. And all of a sudden I saw a track from my house to my next door neighbor's house. Mike thought it would be nice to build a tree house with the wood that he found in my neighbor's garage. So I had to bring, um, all the wood back and I said you know John this is an hours and he said but it was just laying there I figured I could make a tree house so I said no nah, you really can't do that so um, one day uh, the, the same neighbor had a plum tree and it took him years to finally get plums on it and Mike was had such a good heart he didn't realize that the plums had to ripen so he climbed the tree at four and a half, five years old, he climbed the plum tree and picked every one of the plums, put them in a pail and knocked on the door and said, here's your plums. And he said, I picked them for you. <laughs> My neighbor loved him. The, 
And then as he got older, um, he actually taught his brother how to shoot. And we only had like a BB gun at the time. And I was uh, making dinner one night and I said, oh, you know, I'm gonna make a pizza. But I couldn't find my pizza pan. So I'm looking around and all of a sudden I hear this pew, pew. And then from my kitchen, the two bathroom windows are up ahead. And I hear pew. So I look at my glass door and I hear the pinging again. And I look up as I see the barrel of the BB gun slowly coming back into the house. And of course I said, what are you guys doing? And of course the typical answer was nothing. So I look out in the yard and there's my pizza pan spray painted red and they're using that as the target. And then he loved football, but Mike was not really a big kid in high school. So he always dressed up with the football gear. He always sat on the bench, was very patient. That I always used to say, you're like cream. You rise to the top. Like he's always low key about everything. And then it was the last football game and the coach turned around and said, put Murphy out there. And the last game they had a televised issue and Mike went, got a touchdown. He was really good at tackling people down and everything. And, and then the announcer said, this kid is really good. And it's got, he did very well on the SATs. And so the coach said, where was he? He said, sitting on the bench. Cause he's, he never really, you know, he just waited till it was his turn. So um, there was a nice video about him running all over the track and everything. And then Mike came home and he said, mom, did you have something to do with that? And I said, no. And he said to me, you know, did you have to say about the SATs? Cause he was really smart. <laughs> and so they were like, wow, he's smart and he can play football. When he went to Penn State, the first week or two, he said, mom, can I take John with me? So I thought, okay, now John was about eight, but he only looked like about five. He looked really young for his age. And he would take him to school and everything. And um, and he would, you know, leave him at the house with some other person at the, you know, at the room would watch John. And um, he called me up one day and he goes, mom, John is the best chick bait. Everybody loves John. And he says, it's a great way to get chicks. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike always had a plan, whatever he did, you know, and, um, and John had a gr great time going up to the college for a week and then I'd go pick him up and, uh, and his legacy, I think is if you want a good friend, Mike's the good friend. Uh, my name is Claudia and I am James says, uh, older sister. And, um, I guess, I guess the way that I would want people to um, remember James is by considering just how much desire he had for life and um, how fun he was. I mean, I think he's the type of person who would always push you to try something that scared you a little bit um, in a good way. And if you knew him, I feel like you can't help but also remember that he had this real um, easiness and openness to loving people and making them feel very appreciated and included which is something that um, you know right now in the world we could use a little bit more of um, one of my favorite memories of him is from when we were really little and we would um, every couple of weeks my dad would drive us to the Korean grocery store, which in Florida was probably about 40 minutes from where we lived. So for us, probably being under the age of 10 at the time, it was kind of a long car ride there and back. And we would be in the back of my dad's van and my brother and I just to pass the time. We never really listened to the radio, but we would sing together really loudly. And so uh, one of my favorite memories is just being there and singing um, you know, Billy Joel's for the longest time. So we would be just belting that out at the top of our lungs. And my dad never minded. So we would be at our highest volume. Um, and it was just something that we really enjoyed. And I'm not even sure that we were introduced to it by way of Billy Joel. I think we saw it on Alvin, on the Chip Alvin and the Chipmunks, um, one of their episodes. And so that was what we, that, that was like, you know, um, our introduction to, to popular music sometimes by way of Saturday morning cartoons. 
and um, I just remember him being someone who could uh, be right alongside you, um, helping you just kind of savor everything about life that was very good and meant to be relished. So that's something that I really appreciated about him and I hope that people who knew him will continue to remember about James. Knowing now that uh, so much of my ability to relate to people and appreciate people was shaped by who James was as a person, um, you know, I can appreciate that now in a way that I couldn't when I was younger. So I think in high school, when I would like hang out in his room at night and we would just be, you know, talking about all sorts of things into the night, um, I recall seeing a couple books on his desk, some paperback books, and I think some of them might have been um, either biographies or stories um, from Navy SEALs and there was something about the um, kind of the extreme tests that you would have to pass in order to um, not only carry that title but to also be in a position to to serve in the way that was that is unique to Navy SEALs that really appealed to him and so he was already someone who tested himself a lot in, in terms of whether he could not only you know, keep up with others, but to see how far he could push himself. And so when it came to the appeal of the Navy SEALs and what was asked of them and the fact that it just, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing compromised in um, the qualities that you have to have in order to become a Navy SEAL, you know? It's just, it will ask everything of you. And I feel like that appealed to him because he was willing and eager to give his whole self to something that he was um, not just passionate about, but felt like was um, a purposeful way to dedicate his life. And so, yeah, all of those things combined made it so he was kind of hooked on the idea from, um, I don't necessarily consider it an early age because it was high school, but when he started to get more and more serious about it in uh, college, uh, my dad and I, I think at a certain point we paused and we thought, okay, this is not, you know, some passing, um, you know, a flight of, of, of interest. I think he just really surprised all of us, including our extended family with the idea that he was going to keep pushing forward with it. Um, so it was, you know, it's a really, it's a huge source of pride uh, for us, but uh, I think when you know the person, again, going back to what you're talking about right now, when you know the person behind the warrior, it is not necessarily the fact that he became a Navy SEAL that makes us like so, so proud of him. It's kind of like an, it's icing on what was already a very, very uh, wonderfully built cake. Um, and I'm sure he would be rolling his eyes right now if he knew that I was using a cake metaphor to try to describe him. <laughs> but, um, you know, he was, he was a wonderfully well-rounded person as it was. And so the fact that he would take everything that he had in terms of his opportunities and what he could give to whatever he ended up dedicating himself to and putting that all towards becoming a Navy SEAL and serving alongside people that, that I know he respected and admired so much was, um, uh, it was just a good example for us of um, how to live your life in a way that is really intentional and meant to be about more than just, just yourself.